shame had a blinding effect on Harbir. Leaving the flat one morning, he opened the main door to discover Amrit sleeping near the pot plants, a set of house keys dangling from her pocket. He stepped around her like a thief and hurried away as she began to stir. Shame fueled his walk to, to the coffee shop. The next day, the newspaper ran an article about a collision that had occurred on the corner of their street at 8.30 a.m. between a bread truck and a motorcycle. Witnesses to the scene were encouraged to call the listed number with any information. Harbir recognized the location, but he could not recall noticing an accident scene. Surely police officers and flashing lights would have captured his attention. He searched his mind, but he realized that his rage had transported him to some pitch-black road where all of his worst thoughts nested. When empty, the temple was his daily refuge from the thoughts that crowded his brain. It was the only place he ventured to besides the shops. Every day at the crack of dawn, the chill of morning bristling the hairs on his arms, he took the bus and then walked into the narrow lanes. How different the world was when the day was just beginning. School children slumped like sacks of rice on the low plastic bus stop seats. The sky displayed an ever-changing palette of pink, blue, orange, and sometimes fiercely red streaks. He could not adjust his ears to this absence of noise. Taxis and buses sailed along the roads at intervals instead of one gushing torrent. The typical chatter of children was replaced with a collective mournful sigh the sound his granddaughters emitted when told they had to finish all their vegetables. The temple was vacant on weekday mornings, save for a few elderly retirees and the priest whose warbling voice filtered out of the gates and broke like dew among the morning murmurs. Harbir always took time washing his hands after removing his shoes. It disgusted him to see people walking so shamelessly into the temple without cleaning their hands first. After touching the dirt of the earth, how could they enter a place of worship and press their palms to the carpet as they bowed before their holy book? And how could they use those filthy fingers to offer their coins to the temple before rising and finding a spot on the carpet to sit? Witnessing such atrocities brought to mind a list of grievances. The strip of carpet on which people walked when they entered and bowed, when was the last time it had been vacuumed, or at least beaten with a straw broom? It was so littered with lint and thread and hair that it had turned into a dusty red, the color of crumbling brick walls. The constant chatter during services bothered him as well. It came mostly from the women's side of the temple, where covered heads huddled together and exchanged the latest gossip. He did not like the poor ventilation or the slow-running fan that didn't stir the air so much as weakly shift and toss the occasional string of dust onto the floor. There were issues with the cutlery in the dining room. Several times he had picked up a spoon to see a half-faint circle of dried yogurt mirroring his frown. There were problems with the splintering benches, the dented aluminium table tipping his cup of tea at a dangerous angle, the winding food cues that looped around so that there was no way of knowing where they began or ended. <laughs>